Here is an Ericsson GH388 from the year 1996. This is a companion video to the GH337 from 1994. Link in the description below. I'll be comparing the internals and the service mode of this phone and at times referring back to that other video. The GH388 was very popular when it came out. It was very similar to the GH337 though, and they both continue to sell very well alongside each other. I want to have a look at some of the technological differences. So first, I'm going to take this one apart. Let's take the battery off, and if we have a look at the back label, we can see this one was manufactured 1997, week 15. Okay, so first we'll get the slotted screwdriver. See if we can get some of these things out. Yep. Not so bad. I want to take out the bottom two. So that's a Torx. Okay, the front should come off. Yep. And here we have the first look at the insides. Initially, it looks very similar to the 337. So we do have some more slotted screws to remove, these two here. bit underneath comes out as well. And there's one at the top right here. And this one is slightly, slightly different shape, so it's a little bit harder to get out. My screwdriver almost doesn't quite fit. It will take out the board. One of the first things we notice is that it's a lot thinner compared to the GH337. So in this case, they've managed to squeeze all the components onto just one side of the main board, leaving the other side still as the user interface. Pretty much the same, except the display is not attached. The display simply has a connector to connect up to the front. But let's look at this back side of the board. They've somehow managed to consolidate both sides of the GH337 mainboard into just one side on the GH388. So there's the top with the radio section and the main transmitter. We have this section here, which has a lot of the oscillations there's the Philips chip, which I remember from the GH337. Now we have these ceramic capacitors, which I don't remember seeing those on the GH337. I'll have to look back. There's some sort of crystal here. Let's see. 32C73. Here's this chip, which looks like it has some bus lines going to it. I'll just turn this around for a moment. There's that main Ericsson chip, much smaller in this model. Turning it back around, we'll just quickly have a look here. We've got, now that looks like it's going to be the flash memory. And I guess that would make that the RAM. And there's that Texas Instruments chip as well from the GH337. So that could well be user interface again. Maybe something to do with the bottom port. And of course the large 90s style SIM card holder. So that's really impressive work. In only two years they managed to really shrink everything down into this much smaller package which means the phone is actually a little bit thinner as well than the GH388. Really, really quite a nice effort. So again, the back of the phone, which is metal, is again shielding the components. And I wonder how they shielded the front. I guess they put a thick ground plane in there, separating the front of the board from the back. All right, I'm gonna get this together and we'll have a poke around in the software now. So first we'll get all the screws back in. 
Okay, internal screws are in. Just a simple matter of front back on. And reassembly will be complete. Okay, we're all back together and I've just realised that the SIM card holder is not complete, so I'll just clip that bit in there. There we go. Okay, let's power up and have a look. And have a look at that. The phone is locked. All right, uh, four zeros. All right, uh, one, two, three, four. So I don't have the lock code to get into this phone and see the menu. Instead, we'll just switch to service mode and find a way to get rid of that lock as well. I'll be again using the Android tablet to talk to the phone. I'll just get that set up. Now I get the cable ready. So I've got the micro USB adapter and the serial TTL converter and the bottom connector for the phone. And I have to connect up the wires. So red goes to five volts. Oops. Red goes to five volts. Blue is ground. Green is transmit from the phone, so receive on the adapter here. And yellow is receive from the phone, so transmit from here. Okay, that should work. Plug it into the bottom of the phone. All right, let's get this plugged in and see what happens. There's our serial terminal. So when I power up the phone, I should see the number two come up on the screen and then I first send zero B and then the phone will send R and then I have to send this sequence here. So it's this long sequence of hex and this is actually Z80 machine code instructing the phone how to set up and boot into service mode. Now I found a disassembly of this online because this is standard Z80 code that we're seeing here and it shows each instruction and most likely what each instruction is doing to access service mode in the phone. So let's give this a go. I haven't actually tried this yet so I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think the first thing I'll do is check the settings and I will do the debug mode which is 11 15 200 and that should give us debug on the screen when I power up even though it's locked and we're getting nothing now first I have to connect to the device okay good now we'll power up and see yep there we go we've got a phone connected even though the phone is locked, it's still going to give us debug mode on the screen here. Okay. Let's switch to settings. We go to 9600. Looks good. Okay. Let's, let's do the sequence. I'm going to power up and we'll see how it goes. 2, 0, B. No, I missed it. It hasn't worked. I'm not certain I missed it, it just hasn't worked. That's just debug mode in the wrong board, right? Okay, let's try again. Two. Exact same sequence. So something's happening. Okay, I've been messing about with this for a bit and I found a solution to getting into service mode. For the initial sequence, we have to have absolutely no other characters except for the sequence that it needs. So we'll power up, R comes up, and then we can send the full sequence. And sure enough, service program OK. So this will initially not allow any commands because we're not sending any carriage returns or line feeds. So we do have to then switch back to, say, carriage return. And now we should be able to enter commands. Okay. 
though the IME command doesn't appear to exist in this model. So this version of the service program appears to have some different commands. Let's try prog1. So that doesn't exist. Um, analog read. It exists but I didn't enter the correct format. And this does give us a version of 96.05.28. Uh, but I don't know if that's the service program or the main flash. LSPC for checking the locks. So service provider lock. So I can now use service mode to remove the user code lock. And I had a look online and there's a document that shows that the user code is stored in electronic EEPROM write address 03CF. And it's 12 bytes long. There we go. First bit written. First byte written. Okay, electronic right. So I have to go through and set 12 of these bytes to 0. 03D0. Oops. 0. Okay, that's the 12th bit written. So we should now have an unlocked phone. Let's power it up and have a look. Looks pretty good so far. There we go, we're in. And we're in the phone. Okay. I must say that screen looks a lot clearer than the GH337. To finish up, I want to compare the screen of this Ericsson 388 to yet another Ericsson. This time the Ericsson 398, which is yet another variation. The Ericsson 398 uses a full dot matrix display rather than a character dot matrix display. The 388 just has a text welcome and the 398 has a full graphic of the Ericsson logo. And the reason for this is the languages. So if we go to settings, Asian characters, hence the need for a full graphic display. Okay, that's it. That's the Ericsson GH388 and a little bit of the GH398.